As I go through this presentation, you'll see it's about changing a company culturally to support bigger, better, faster improvements. This is the bailiwick of top management. Consultants and TLC advocates should bring this to the CEO. Don't wait until they're needed. Feel free to ask me for my PowerPoint slides and use them. Business owners, this is for you. If the boss isn't all in, getting lasting results is much more difficult. I've disappeared myself for a minute to give you a quick uh, introduction to TOC. You'll hear that said throughout this presentation. It stands for the Theory of Constraints. And Ellie, who is Ellie Goldratt who is the, uh, the father of theory of constraints, the person who came up with this idea that in any system, there can only be, at any given time, one or at least very few things that hold the system back. Improving those things improve the entire system. Improving other things than those things doesn't make much difference. It can cost a lot of money, but it doesn't get you enormous results. Ellie wrote a book called The Choice. It was about applying theory of constraints, TOC, to yourself. And it was a dialogue in the uh, fashion of old Greek dialogues from the Greek philosophers. And his dialogue was with his daughter, Ephrat. While he was writing the book, Ephrat kept a little diagram, just a little notes to herself to remind her what was going on. And as you can see, the thing at the top uh, is a full life. That's what people want. Ellie had a joke that said that if you think you want an easy life, well, just hit yourself on the head with a hammer very hard. They'll bring the food to your bed for the rest of your life, and you'll have a very easy life. Everyone recoils at the idea of doing that to themselves, and so Ellie suggested that perhaps maybe what you want is not an easy life, but rather a full life. And to have one, you have to have enough meaningful success, as you can see at the top of this diagram. To have that, you must have the stamina to overcome failures, many opportunities, and the ability to collaborate with people. I understand Ellie was amazed when he saw the simplicity of a frat's summary of their dialogue, but it's just inherent simplicity, isn't it? The first pillar of TOC. Notice I've added the fifth obstacle Ellie mentioned in the introduction to his unfinished book, The Science of Management, Fear of Uncertainty. If you read Blue Ocean Strategies, you know huge breakthroughs typically don't work the first time or the second or even the tenth. Sometimes perfect plans fail due to unanticipated changes in the environment. Some plans are bad from the start. Some implementations are poor or take too long. Implementing fast and well can overcome both shortcomings and resistance. My presentation today is about people. People are not a trivial puzzle. And as Ellie used to say, and nobody peeps about it, at least not much in the TOC community. Just saying, the ability to collaborate with people isn't enough. There's no higher math in this presentation. This is common sense. You'll immediately know where I'm coming from. My presentation has just three parts. First, we'll explore the context in which you must gain collaborators. And in the end, I'll speak briefly about new insight in PUGI, the process of ongoing improvement. But most of the presentation will be about the 10 steps that companies should take to engage and empower their team to get huge results. Before tackling any change, it behooves us to first take stock of where we are and why we're there. No employee is born in your business. You hired every one of them, so they come from the outside. Make no mistake about it, you're starting out from a bad place. Consequently, employees keep their ears open for better paying jobs. They're in the habit of doing it. If you don't know the term chattel, consider yourself lucky. It means property, but in an ugly sense when applied to people. Lack of trust is a consequence. What can we expect from this? We've taught people, and they learned, to look for better jobs, better feeling jobs, better paying jobs, 
And so here's the first consequence. And here's the second. And a subset of those, we terminate. Nice word, huh? Look at these lovely people. Hmm. Only the most naive trust you. But can you even get them to give you a chance? Your present staff may look like this, especially when posing for a picture. But do they really trust you? For my international friends, going postal is an American slang for becoming uncontrollably angry at work. It stems from what is now the distant past, 1986, when a U.S. post office worker shot and killed co-workers and his supervisor out of frustration. Five years later, it happened again in 1991, twice. In 1993, and again twice in 2006. One of those two was a woman, which is extraordinarily rare for mass murderers. The other one ran over a supervisor with his car over and over again, went inside to shoot the postmaster, not finding him, came back outside and shot the supervisor. About him, they said, and I quote, Gallagher felt pressured by a week-long work time study and extra time added to his new route. Most recently, in 2017, a postal employee shot his supervisor and the postmistress. To put going postal in perspective, the post office is good. Such workplace violence is three times more likely to happen to companies other than the post office. Of course, this type of outrageous behavior must be just the very tip of the disgruntled employee iceberg. They don't need to go so far as killing to cause damage or just less good outcomes. Have I gotten your attention? Remember what we're trying to do here. We want to have a meaningful life. In order to do that, we've got to deal with the reality behind both of these faces. That's it. Let's hope I'm smiling because there's another way, and you'll know it too very soon. This part is the majority of the presentation. Don't worry, most people don't go postal. Employers are not responsible for their employees. Employees are 100% responsible for their own actions. So are employers just victims? No, employers must be responsible for their company and to their employees. There's a difference between being responsible for somebody and to them. That begs the question. Responsibility demands the question. What part do employers play in bad outcomes, bad environments, turnover, lack of trust, bad behavior, and what should they do about it? Employers don't hold all the cards. It's a two-way street, but there's much the company can do. Here are 10 responsible steps to deal with people. Before we jump into the steps, briefly here, they are all born from one thing, the employer's responsibility, to look out for your employees. A side effect is it builds a good reputation. I'm showing the list here at the beginning so you have something to look back on to summarize the message later. I'll go through each one in detail. As Dan Pink popularized the idea, you may want to pay enough to take money off the table. And if you can't afford to pay enough, raise your prices. If that kills your company, the company doesn't have a reason to exist. Step two ain't so easy. Train them on TOC, silo thinking, throughput accounting, about being non-constraint resources, how to subordinate to the current decision of how to, to exploit the constraint. Give them autonomy.
don't treat them like robots. Let me tell you a story about step four. For the last eight years, one of my companies has outsourced its accounting to another company. My general manager told me recently that there have been more turnover in their accounting department of five people than we've had in our whole company. Why is this? Any job that's properly defined will suit some particular personality. Obviously, people come with different personalities. Some are accommodating, some are argumentative, some are quietly thoughtful, others need to talk stuff out. Some get bored easily, others are much more patient. Some are detail-oriented and compliant, while others are quite flexible with the rules. Some are impulsive, others are rigid, some have vast stamina, while others need frequent breaks. We are not only not all the same, we are dramatically different. This means that some people are great for one job and stink at another. Neither terrible matches or perfect matches are the problem. The latter works out beautifully. The former so badly that turnover will save the day inevitably and probably soon. The real problem comes from marginal fits. Any employee may put up with it. Management will have bigger fish to fry. It lingers, festers. The employee must adapt to his role. This invisibly consumes more and more capacity over time. The company pays for the capacity but never benefits from it. For the employee, the job becomes more and more an imposition. No, we want a perfect match. Let me give you an example. So we want a uh, metrics maven, someone who tracks the metrics for multiple companies. And it requires an analytical mind, patience, detail orientation, and cooperation. This is small print in case you can't read it. Evan is a thoughtful, disciplined person who is particularly attentive to, careful of, and accurate with the details involved in his job. He identifies problems and enjoys solving them, particularly within his area of expertise. He works at a steady, even pace, leveraging his background for the betterment of the team, company, or customer. And Don Clifton tells us there's no more effective way to empower people than to see each person in terms of his or her strengths. Recently, the company Evan works for has found itself in the luxurious position of having a backlog of customers wanting to come in that need implementation. It turns out that implementing new customers requires the same skill set. So Evan is now helping us out with that too, using his surplus capacity. Step five, from everything Ellie ever told us, if you're not on a John Seddon, search him up on YouTube. You'll love his message. Don't sweat the assets. Talks about sweating the people, the people assets. So what do we have so far? Number five, non-constraint downtime is encouraged. Number four, only give people jobs that fit them. Three, give them some autonomy. And lastly, educate them holistically. Is this enough to guarantee sufficiency? Let's check on to step six. Step six is choking the release. This diagram shows the five separate vicious cycles that result from trying to do too many things at once. Limiting the open tasks avoids chaos, which can destroy the existing flow, the primary flow. I've banished myself temporarily so that you can see this diagram completely. And let me go through and give you a little explanation of it. Many open tasks and priorities change. Those are two realities, preconditions, things that occur in our normal lives. When they both happen at the same time, Sometimes we're forced to switch tasks. And because of that, it causes more bad multitasking. The problem with multitasking is every time we switch jobs, it takes a little bit of time for us to figure out where we are in the new job, get up to speed, be prepared, get productive, and then we actually start working on the, on the task at hand. When we switch tasks, 
we then have to put that task away. There's a little bit of put away time in our minds and then more time to remember where we were on the old task and get started again. The, the consequence is that very bad outcomes occur. And you'll see what I'm talking about here. The first one, for example, quality being down. When you switch tasks, you don't stay on, on target. The quality goes down. You'll notice a green, black, heavy black line coming down from quality down, going to many open tasks. So when quality goes down and you have to go back and fix the problem that poor quality caused, that leads to another open task. And if that's a high priority item, it may make you switch to fixing the damage that you did through the bad multitasking. And we get back up to more bad multitasking again, and you'll see the touch time goes up. This is the little bit of time it takes our brains to, to spin down and spin back up with the next task. When touch time goes up, it makes lead time go up, the time that it takes you to actually deliver what it is you're working on. And bad multitasking itself makes you work more slowly, which causes lead time to go up. When lead time goes up, people notice, hmm, things aren't getting done as fast as I thought. And the next green haloed heavy black line, which is really just a catch-22 or a vicious cycle, goes down to make the priorities change, right? The longer that, that something's open, the more priorities are going to change. That causes you to switch tasks, switch tasks. again, more bad multitasking, Touch time's up, lead time's up, we keep coming around in that loop. When lead time comes up, there's more missynchronization. By that, I mean not having the other person that you need to collaborate with to finish your task, which makes you go back to switch to another task to keep yourself busy while that person's busy until they get done. You don't want to be sitting around outside their office waiting forever, so you switch tasks. More bad multitasking occurs. You can see how this is getting to be a vicious cycle over and over again. The missynchronization means that capacity, that's the whole capacity of the company, not just your capacity, but that too. That's down. When you have less capacity, lead time goes up again. It causes more priorities to, it allows more priorities to change. And when lead time's up, you have another pressure, which is to start sooner. And when you have the pressure to start sooner, it means you're more likely to open a task earlier than you would have before, meaning it overlaps more tasks and causes more bad multitasking. So there's the fifth vicious cycle is coming back to, uh, to many to open more open tasks because we have this pressure to start sooner. That's the nasty situation that comes from bad multitasking. All right, here I'm back again. And remember, improvements can only come out of protective capacity, out of that capacity. That's the only capacity that's available to make improvements. The primary flow, on the other hand, is the flow of goods and services and supported by the primary capacity. This is why you had to have the people there in the first place. Which means that employees dragging their feet could be your fault. Maybe they're being brilliant. Taking on one more thing could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Or they could be lazy bastards. I was always amazed at Ellie's templated solutions and later the S&Ts. The solutions usually had three separate phases. I would have been happy with one. I've smartened up since then. Stopping bad multitasking company-wide gives employees the second opportunity to improve. Can we find a third contributor in our quest for sufficiency? How about step seven? Bosses tend to have a sense of urgency. This often works against them. If you want people to learn, wait for them to make mistakes and then let them pull the knowledge. Theory ain't practice. Have patience. Your working career is a marathon. Remember the story of the tortoise and the hare from Aesop's Fables. And finally, step seven adds triple sufficiency. Why indeed? We want employees to gain mastery. Isn't it obvious? To get better work out of them, to sweat the assets. It's all about us. Forget about them. Will that gain their trust? No. Mastery is for them. Back to Dan Pink's popularization of the research, he wrote a book on it. Save your money. Watch this 11-minute video instead. I think it's that autonomy, mastery, and purpose lead to greater personal satisfaction. Personal satisfaction leads to better performance. Reason number two, it is what it is. Everybody's good for something. 
If somebody can't or won't make it in your organization, don't let them suffer. Don't let their coworkers suffer. Help them find what they can be great at and where they can make a difference. If they're stuck in the habit of being lazy bastards or still don't know what they want, even after these 10 steps, there's a hard lesson that they need to learn. For reasons I no longer remember, I contacted Randy England maybe 10 years after we decided to part ways. He bounced around between a few jobs before finding one that he stuck with. I asked him, how you doing? And here's what he told me. It pays the bills. And I like the work. But it isn't shippers. I don't expect to ever find another place like shippers. I'm telling you this story because I hope you'll prove him wrong. Make your workplace like this. Step eight, provide training to understand coworkers. One of the intuitive blunders of human beings is their sense that others think like they do. The human race is powerful because we're all so different. Yet how do we give advice? It's in our language. If I were you, I'd... Have you ever heard someone say, knowing you, you should, whatever it is. Given training, people make breakthroughs in their interpersonal exchanges. You can use the same personality inventory tool you use to find the right people. There are many others, but I like these the best. Use external experts until you can train internal expertise. Someone will probably be really interested. The higher up they are, the better. Understanding begets acceptance. Acceptance begets less blaming. Less blaming begets less polarization. This calls for another story. I don't listen to the news. I don't take a paper. The only magazine I get is about cars. People are fascinated by controversy. News agencies know that. Therefore, they provide you controversy 24-7 in order to make more money. It may be good for their business, but it stinks for you because it leads to alienation from some sets of people. We all need to work together to do some good. It's beneficial that we have different viewpoints and come to different conclusions. Vive la différence. Ditch the news. Your friends will talk about any real news that happens. You'll hear about it, but real news is rare. Less polarization and blaming begets real friendships. Strong friendships at work correlate strongly with satisfaction in the workplace. And don't forget, it's satisfaction that begets mastery. Here's a picture of the sequence combined with the given that you spent more time at work than any other thing and the given that people are social creatures. Together, that yields real friendships at work. And your friendship supports the collaboration we need for full lives. Step nine, relevant metrics are made public. Simply changing the metrics can make a big difference. If you don't believe me, go watch Ravi Galani's presentations from this TOC ICO or Bo Gaines' presentation, which happened the second morning. The same way you have one improvement you are all trying to accomplish together company-wide, everybody should understand the one metric the company should focus on, the whole company. The secondary metrics are just like idiot lights on your car. You don't have to worry about oil pressure until it gets too high or too low. That's when the light should come on. Experts then can do some diagnosis. I did a whole presentation on that subject last summer at this same conference in Berlin. Check it out. Here's an example. Just a simple dashboard. Evan does this every month. The distributor's prime metric is down, but their sec secondary metrics look good. They ship on time and full over 99% of the time. Their most limited non-constraint resource has at least 20% free capacity, and they're producing cash from operations. If you're measuring more than five things, your people are working against each other. Now, what have we accomplished as a result of our efforts so far? Treating mistakes as learning opportunities, making the metrics public so folks know what's happening and what isn't, and after a while, employees do actually notice that you're looking out for them. All three contribute to winning their trust. Don't expect fast results from everybody. It will take a while for some of them to swing around. Again, triple sufficiency. 
if employees are given autonomy to act on their own and they know how to help holistically and they're encouraged to have free time, then you can trust them to identify wonderful opportunities for improvement. Less inner office drama helps with focus. Here's where step nine comes in. Relevant system-wide metrics lets them see how much difference they are making. The quicker the feedback, the sooner they do better. Daily feedback is better than monthly. Forward-looking metrics are better than historical ones. Give them feedback. Finally, when management freezes or kills less critical improvement projects, the focus gets even stronger. Wow, I went overboard that time. With the focus and the skills, this was the last of what people really need, purpose. Why is purpose so important? Heck, it may be the most important. People are purpose-driven. Suicide rates increased 70% over the last decade. A correlating factor is the decline in religious observance. And look, it's happening in the workers, the age of the workers more than anything else. A correlating factor is the decline in religious observance. Churches provide, educate, and drill a sense of higher purpose. If people are turning their backs to church, then they need another source. They spend a lot of time at work. This is a call to action for employers. They need a sense of purpose and making money for us might not do it. But let's add some things together. A team focused on the good stuff, plus employees who trust you and have the time, plus when they're doing it for their friends equals employees who are willing to change. That brings us to step 10 at last, and it's just a trigger that gets results. Ask them for their ideas. There's no more buy-in necessary. They'll do it. If you want to be dictatorial, now's the time. Take the time to get consensus, however long it takes. Then you can exercise your authority to demand implementation. We listen to you. You had your chance. Do what we all agreed or quit. The only question is the when. And that depends on how you release the improvement work to the staff. So I'm going to say very little about this because so much has already been said. TOC does a great job here. Find your North Star with the goal tree. Identify undesirable effects. Show how they have a common ancestor. Break the core cloud. Recast the future in a, in a future reality tree. Anticipate negative branch reservations. And finally, write your strategy and tactics tree and implement. The five focusing steps, beautiful. I recently realized that you sometimes have to reconsider them even if the constraint has not been broken. And the layers of buy-in are, are also useful. And Delta T has to be bigger than Delta E for any local project to proceed. Here's what I recommend from a new book I'm working on with Ellie Schragenheim, Rocco Saras. It will be called Throughput Economics. As a group, assess each idea. Estimate the reasonably optimistic Delta T, Delta I, and Delta OE. Estimate the reasonably pessimistic changes in TI and OE. That gives you a likely range that you will be able to hit more than 95% of the time. From that, it's easy to share stretch goals you'd be lucky to hit. And also, nobody wants to accept the bottom of the range. So we get better than average performance than we do with a single number. Next step, kill some ideas. And as a little aside, there are only three possible ways a project can proceed. One, it delivers more T than it costs in OE. It reduces OE and doesn't affect T at all. It's the elimination of pure waste. Stop spending OE, which doesn't produce at least as much T. And remember, in all cases, <clears throat> protective capacity must be maintained, but not necessarily surplus capacity. However, if it takes a long time to buy more of a particular type of capacity and you're planning for growth, it could be inadvisable to ditch even surplus capacity considering the future. Back to where we were. Make a priority list and freeze all but one. This leaves the company with one thing. 
everybody should always be able to immediately say what the one thing is. Education is key. Step by step, you move from one top to the priority to the next. That's it. I appreciate you listening. Please let me know by email how would I confuse you, where I might be wrong, or what you have to add. Here's my email address at the bottom underneath my picture. And this material is the best of what I've learned and dreamt up over my 30 years of owning companies. Thank you. Bye.